episode is set in a post-apocalyptic future where 20 years ago, a bug infected and destroyed all the computers. With power grids down and connections lost, our narrator is convinced it was the loss of access to erotic movies that freaked people out and led to mayhem. As a fellow narrator, I am inclined to agree. So, cities built walls to protect themselves, while people who were mostly criminals were relegated and thrown out in the chaos to fight for what little was left, which in America is mostly cars and guns. Apart from the two categories broadly classified as haves and have-nots, there is a third category of people who travel between the two worlds. They are described as legends by our narrator, John Doe, because he is one of these people who have taken it upon themselves to deliver precious cargo from one walled city to another, of course, in return for a commission. The risk for milkmen, like John, comes when the vultures, a word he uses to describe the relegates, decide to snatch the commodities and utilize the cars and guns to loot at every opportunity they get. John has become accustomed to traveling and frequent attacks. Even in such situations, he keeps a jolly mood and only sometimes wishes how nice it would have been if he were still with his family. A new consignment takes John to New San Francisco, where the COO, Raven, wants to talk to John, which is a big deal. He is taken inside, stripped naked, sprayed with detergent and water, and gets his bottom sprayed with a puff perfume to make him presentable for the meeting. In short, a bath. He is taken to a pub to meet Raven, where she tells him about the job. John is required to bring back a delivery from New Chicago. John immediately refuses because New Chicago is far away and the trip is too risky. Raven takes him on a tour of the city, and John is surprised to see the city functioning in an organized fashion. Raven continues and offers to provide him citizenship of New San Francisco if he successfully retrieves the package. It is a chance for John to lead a normal, safe life and build a place he can call home. It is too good of an opportunity to pass for John, and he agrees. Raven takes John to her home, where John meets Raven's husband, Noah, and their baby, Dove. John is baffled to see a baby as he has never met one in his life. During dinner, John sees them happy as a family and is reminded of his parents. He carries a picture of them and looks at it whenever he is reminded of them. Raven hands John a watch and instructs him that he has 10 days to bring back the package. One second over and the deal expires. Soon after John leaves, Raven hands Dove to a security guard to give her back to her mother and tells Noah that his payment is in his apartment, indicating it was all a ruse to make John agree to the assignment. We're introduced to another protagonist, Quiet, who is stuck with her brother in a gunfight with law enforcement in Nevada. They are being chased by Agent Stone and his men, and they soon lead the siblings into a trap that sets off when their car drives over it and sends their car flying. The car overturns, and the chase comes to a halt. Stone, who follows the theory of an old chief that little fires should be put out before it turns into big fire, approach the siblings, and even though they have only committed petty crimes, Stone delivers punishment. He presents them with a choice. Either he kills them, or they kill themselves to save the other. The brother decides to save Quiet and shoots himself. Stone brands Quiet with his signature and leaves a bullet for her in case she plans to follow her brother's path and leave her in excruciating pain. Meanwhile, John makes a stop at Tommy's to meet an old friend. He procures a map from Tommy, who is clearly apprehensive about John traveling east, and warns him about the route that is unlike any other route he has ever seen. John soon embarks on the journey and is crossing Vegas when Quiet suddenly appears in front of his car, forcing him to stop. She is wearing her brother's jacket and seeks vengeance. She puts the nozzle of her gun in John's mouth and signals him to step out. John also points his gun at her, and as they stand there, the ruler of Vegas, Sweet Tooth, a chap who wears a creepy clown mask, ominously heads towards them. John tries to convince Quiet to join hands with him, but with the onset of danger, she focuses on facing Sweet Tooth. 
but as they pull the trigger, they realize the guns are empty. While John struggles to load his guns and drop the bullets in the process, Quiet takes advantage of this and takes off with John's car. John hurries and slides from the open door, and this time holds a loaded gun on Quiet's head, while she holds a knife at John's other head. They strike a truce considering the situation, and Quiet scoots to let John take control of his car. Meanwhile, Sweet Tooth laughs like a madman and starts firing at them, calling it a show, and makes them drive into a casino. The scene shifts to a dingy warehouse turned into a slaughterhouse selling human meat. Two men sit tied in bathtubs and blame each other for getting caught by the butchers. Suddenly, all the butchers start falling one by one as they are being shot dead by the snipers on Stone's team. Once done, the entire squad steps in and frees the two men. Noticing they are guards, Stone asks them to join them in bringing law and order back to the divided states of America. Meanwhile, in the casino, John has to stop to fix the tire while Quiet keeps watch, but Sweet Tooth quickly finds them, and to save herself, Quiet leads Sweet Tooth's attention to where John is hiding before hiding herself in the vent. Sweet Tooth throws some punchlines before throwing a machete at John that he narrowly avoids. They soon get into a fist fight, but John is no match for brawny Sweet Tooth, who knocks John down into punches. He continues brutally assaulting John till his favorite song, Thong Thong, plays, and they both join in an impromptu duet. Sweet Tooth is mad because John said he would come to the show, but soon after, he started firing at him. John says he has trust issues. Nevertheless, he promises to be at the opening night after Sweet Tooth intimidates him to do so. Meanwhile, Stone takes the new recruits, Stu and Mike, to the headquarters inside the Hoover Dam, where they are shown around. They are taken for their initiation, which is to protect their broken supply truck from the seagulls. However, Stone omits explaining what seagulls refer to, and the deputy hands the new recruits two giant guns with silencers. They take their positions, and soon a car pulls up near the truck. They soon find out that the survivors are called seagulls, and Stu asks the deputy why they are called by that name. The deputy counter questions him by asking what one would call trash eaters, leaving Stu baffled. On the other hand, Mike has no problem and kills one of the survivors. Stone asks Stu to finish the job, but Stu cannot make himself pull the trigger, so Mike covers for him and kills the other remaining survivor. Satisfied with their work, Stone leaves them in charge and warns Stu not to miss the target again. Back at the casino, John has somewhat befriended Sweet Tooth, and Sweet Tooth takes John to the theater where he sleeps. He introduces John to Harold, a paper bag, and Sweet Tooth's only friend, and since they are sharing secrets, John talks about Evelyn, his car, and how much she means to him. Sweet Tooth points out that John is weird for talking about his car as if she were a real woman. He then shows John a glass chamber with Quiet trapped in it and says he found her in the vents, and now he plans to starve her. While Sweet Tooth gets busy selecting a costume for the show, John moves closer to the chamber and asks why he should help her when she tried to kill him every chance she gets. Quiet shows him Evelyn's keys, and John gives in. He persuades Sweet Tooth to let her out, so instead of two meat slaps, which is Sweet Tooth's description of a clap, he will get four meat slaps. Sweet Tooth agrees and gives them seats at a table he has reserved for them. He serves them food and red wine. Quiet starts eating immediately, and John again tries to bring her to his side while gobbling down the delicious steak, but Quiet ignores him. Soon the show starts, and dressed in a cream suit and blue bow tie, Sweet Tooth announces he will be presenting his one-man show. He pretends to be various characters and recites the tour guide brochure from the hotel, and by the time he is done, both John and Quiet have fallen asleep. Sweet Tooth jumps down the stage with a thump, which wakes the two up, and asks them their opinion about his performance. John quickly says he loved it, but every time he praises the act, it enrages Sweet Tooth, and he starts smashing things with his machete. He asks them to tell him the truth, and as he is about to attack them again, Quiet speaks for the first time and says his performance was a snooze fest and boring, but in a more colorful language. 
Quiet suggests he needs to get out more, and surprisingly, Sweet Tooth agrees. He says he can't wait for his audience, and he must go out to hunt them down. He announces about taking the show down the road, which earns him meat-slapping claps from John and Quiet. They become the first people to walk out of Las Vegas alive. Sweet Tooth pours gasoline all over the casino and burns it before hitting the road. Meanwhile, back at headquarters, Stu sees Mike getting his food coupon punched twice for two kills. They are on patrol duty with a deputy when they see John's car approaching. Stu asks John for his open road license, and while John talks to Mike and Stu, Quiet recognizes the deputy who branded her. She gets out of the car, ready to shoot him, but gets tased by Mike. John also steps out, but gets tased by Stu. And as the camera pans to John's Casio watch, it shows he has only eight days to make the delivery. In a flashback, we're taken to the year 2002, when the bug had started infecting the electronics, making them ineffective. All the electronics effectively start shutting down, including the satellites that crash back to the Earth, creating chaos. In the present, John and Quiet are arrested and sent to DMV. Driving without a license sends the lawbreakers down the red line, which John and Quiet soon learn is something to be avoided as they hear people scream. They are made to go down the purple line, which is not bad comparatively. Meanwhile, Stu and Mike search John's car, and Stu finds a picture of John and his parents and smiles. He still has good left in him, but the same can't be said about Mike, who has changed drastically. Soon they are joined by Shepard, the deputy, and Stu shows him the map he found. Shepard is genuinely shocked to see the map that is made specifically to avoid all checkpoints and outposts. He relays the information to Stone, who goes to meet John and Quiet. He discloses that he is building a dam nearby, and the only way to cross it is from the place they are currently being held. John tries to negotiate his release with Stone, but Stone is enraged and asks how he got the map. Quaya cannot stand seeing her brother's murderer sit in front of her and spits on Stone's face, which ensures that they won't be leaving anytime soon. In a flashback, Stone used to be a mall cop who got intimidated by two teenage girls before everything went down. After the chaos struck, Stone was left to fend for himself, and one day, while stocking up supplies as things were scarce, his neighbors, Marge and Rick, robbed him of his arms to get out of the city before knocking him out. We then see him sitting and crying after being robbed. He drinks his sorrow when a restaurant owner comes to his house asking for help, as there are some people who have thrown him out. Stone is reluctant because he feels nothing matters now, the world is over. But seeing the disappointment on the restaurant owner's face, Stone takes out his father's gun and heads to the restaurant. He goes inside and finds that the terrorists are actually civilians looking for food to bring back to their families. The owner freaked out seeing them holding guns, which is for their protection. Suddenly, one of them starts making fun of Stone's fragile behavior, which enrages him, and he ends up shooting them all. In the present, John and Quiet are being interrogated by Mike and Stu to give the name of the cartographer. When they do not comply, Mike and Stu make them fill out forms and play the Barbie song in full blast as their punishment. They are also given an eye test, and every time they try to act smart, they are maced. When that doesn't work, the duo is given a classic punishment called waterboarding. Stone meets them to ask if they are ready to give him a name, but John disses him and says he will never give the name as the man who made the map is his only friend. Stone orders to take them down the red line and mocks Quiet's brother for taking a bullet for her. While waiting for their turn, Quiet and John talk about their families, and John tells her that no matter how much he tries, he can't remember his parents' faces. He also discloses the reason he is traveling to New Chicago. Soon they are called, and Stu is tasked to accompany them. They find out that the end of the red line leads to a cliff from where the fugitives are made to jump. John and Quiet manipulate Stu psychologically and offer to take him along if he helps them escape. Stu's soft heart gives in and helps them get the keys. Quiet finds her brother's jacket in the room where they keep every fugitive's belongings and steals a gun to face Stone. She finds Stone's office and sneaks in to find Shepard peeling and unpeeling his banana. 
quiet kills him by repeatedly striking his head with a gun. Outside the end room, Mike finds the cut cable zip ties and alerts the other officers of prisoners on the loose. John and Stu decide to move forward without quiet and reach the car, but Evelyn's batteries are drained because someone left her lights on. John and Stu start pushing the car and quiet arrives to join them. They start the car, and John and Quiet are able to get in it, but Stu gets knocked out by the car's faulty trunk, and they have no choice but to leave him behind. They manage to escape, but John is upset because they stripped them of his guns, and he doesn't know how he'll reach New Chicago without anything to protect himself with. Quiet reveals that she saw a sanctuary city in the Midwest on the map in Stone's office, where things are unaffected even after the apocalypse. The town is HQ Topeka, and she is headed to that city, not revealing her real motive behind going to the place. It is already dark, and John is still driving. He almost falls asleep because Quiet is meticulously living up to her name, making it tiresome for John to drive in silence. They suddenly find themselves surrounded by four huge trucks blocking them from all four sides. The truck in front opens the door and the truck behind them forces their car into the truck. After they come to a halt, Watts, the lady who runs the trucks and their operations, greets them and asks them to step outside their car. She figured John was a milkman from the sticker on his car's hood and says someone wants to talk to him. She asks the operators to lock it up, and the moving truck makes makeshift bridges for them to be able to walk from one truck to the other without any hindrance, and welcomes them to the convoy. While looking around, Quiet finds a woman making prosthetics, and offers a metal middle finger for Quiet's missing finger. Soon, Watt's granny is wheeled in, but John catches her bluff, and granny gets up from the chair. She tells John that it may not look like it, but her insides are gone, and she needs him to pick up some medicines for her. In exchange, she will upgrade Evelyn with weapons she gets from her supplies. John knows he needs it to make the trip. John agrees, and the next day, they head to the pharmacy using the directions Granny has written for them. During their drive, they come across an ominous sign of holy men that Watts was talking about. They reach the address and meet the pharmacist, Amber, who offers them tea, which paralyzes them as she mistakes them for holy men. She is ready to deliver more torture to make them answer her questions when Quiet tells her about the slip Granny gave them, and upon seeing it, Amber gives them the antidote. She apologizes for her mistake and prepares the medicines Granny asked for. John is interested to know if Watts really threw Amber out of the truck, as mentioned by Granny and Amber confirms she did. But after Amber poisoned her because they were in love and Watts couldn't make room for her, they start leaving but hear bells, and as expected, they were followed by the holy men who are a biker gang. John decides to get off the road, and they hide in a cinema hall. John puts on Blank Man, and they end up making dialogues and laughing about it since the movie doesn't have sound. Quiet opens up about her brother's memories, and they share many such bonding moments before they fall asleep. The next morning, however, Quiet's mood sours when she finds John has washed her brother's jacket. Now she has nothing of him left on it, and enraged, she walks back to the car and doesn't talk to him the entire ride back to the convoy. They give the medicines to Watts, and she tells them that Granny is dying, and the medicines are to help her more comfortable as she passes on. They sit with Granny, who explains she wants to go on her own terms, a luxury that many people don't have with what is going around in the world. She keeps her promise and rewards John with an upgraded car, while she hands her diary, which is practically a depiction of her younger days with erotic visuals, to quiet. She then calls Watts and tells her that the most important thing in life is time with the people she cares about and hands her the extra flower she had asked for from Amber to Watts. She hints at Watts to mend her relationship with Amber before it is too late. Soon, Granny passes in her Chevrolet in peace, and Watts gathers all the rigors to pay homage to her granny, whose name was Kathy Stropton, the top-selling real estate agent in Boca Raton. The riggers then push Granny's car out on the road, and Watts blows up the car. At the after party, Watts takes Granny's advice and calls Amber on the radio to discuss things and mend their relationship. 
John also feels bad for what he did and apologizes to Quiet, and she accepts his apology. They decide not to stay at the convoy and soon head towards their destination in a fully equipped Evelyn. Unbeknownst to John, Quiet is carrying some of Granny's medicine for her hidden agenda. And that's a wrap for this series recap. Thanks for watching.